Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the scriptures, that they're your word. And your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. Lord, pierce our hearts this morning. Give us understanding and wisdom into, and insight into your word. May it speak into our hearts, into the depths of our being, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So a young teenager was out with his friends, and uh, he was a little late, and curfew was coming up, so he had to take a shortcut, and he went through the cemetery on his way home. And uh, as he got into the cemetery, he began to hear this tapping noise, and he was quite unnerved by the tapping that was going on in the, cem in the cemetery, and in, through the darkness and the fog in the cemetery. And then he, he came up, and there was an, a little old man who, with a hammer and chisel, was hacking on a tombstone, and the kid took a sigh of relief. Oh, I thought it was a ghost. You scared me to death. Hey, old man, what are you doing working so late? To which the man replied, ah, these nincompoops, they spelled my name wrong. <laughs> when I was a child, I was given an album uh, by my parents for Christmas, which I loved and played to pieces. I've, got, I've still got it at home. Um, Alfred Hitchcock telling ghost stories in his silly, funny, weird way. You know, it begins and there's a drip, drip of the faucet in the background, and by the end of the album, he drowns in his basement um, trying to fix the drip. Um, it's, it's a wonderful album. Um, and that's my introduction to Alfred Hitchcock. And so I, oh, I thought he was wonderful. Come to find out, that's not what he was famous for. He wasn't a children's author. Uh, he was this producer and director of movies. And so um, as I got older, I saw Psycho on TV and Frenzy on TV and The Birds on TV. Um, and Alfred Hitchcock came to take on a whole new meaning and dimension to me as I was getting a little bit older. Um, and when people met him, they were surprised. You know, here's this jovial, jolly, rotund, polite little man, something of a jokester and a prankster. That's what I got off my album, so I, I get all that. But they, they came to think that, you know, they'd meet this evil genius. Um, and he didn't give off that vibe at all because he was very adept at hiding his depravity. Some of us are good at that. And Alfred Hitchcock was one of them. Um, he grew up in a, in a very difficult set of circumstances. He had a secret that he didn't share with people till his biography came out, then he shared it. But as a child, he could never remember having playmates. He was never allowed to play with other children. Um, and so his imagination became his friend, and he entertained himself for hours with his imagination. You remember Romans chapter 8, verse 28, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Not everything that happens to us is good. Um, Alfred grew up in what was probably a common home back in the day, but I mean today his, he, his parents would lose custody of him. His father loved the belt. If he misbehaved, he would get a hiding. But his mother's psychological torture was even worse. Every night of his childhood, he had a stand at attention at the foot of his bed. And he had to recount every sin, sin, every wrongdoing he'd made during the course of the day. And then his mother would harangue him and lecture him about every sin and peccadillo in his life uh, incessantly until he was allowed to go to bed. And if he thought he had it hard at home, when he turned 11, because this was England, they sent him off to St. Ignatius College, where the Jesuits had a justified and well-deserved reputation for harsh punishment. So off he went as an 11-year-old to boarding school with the Jesuits, and uh, he soon discovered that, um, that they were savage and that they were cruel. And so he learned um, that if he misbehaved, his name would go on a list. And if your name is on the list, the punishment didn't occur then. The punishment occurred at bedtime in front of all your peers and in front of all of your friends where you would be savagely whipped. And you had all day to think about and dread and anticipate the punishment that was going to be yours when it came time for bed. And he used all of these experiences in creating. He understood fear. 
he understood dread, and he wove those themes and those understandings into his movies, and, and that's where he learned these things. One of my favorite movies is Strangers on a Train. It's a psychological thriller. It's a piece of film noir. There's a psychopath on the train, and he sits down with this guy, and you know, there's um, somebody that they each want killed, somebody that they want to pay back, somebody who needs to get their pound of flesh. And so the psychopath says, well, I'll kill your person if you kill my person. And this is genius because we have no motive to kill the other person's person. And we'll have an alibi for the murder of the person that we want dead. And so we'll get away with murder. It's a sordid, ugly, nasty tale. Um, that's kind of what he majored on. Um, it's a great movie if you haven't seen it. And he understood something about human nature, his own human nature, that there is deep down in our soul an itch that we can't scratch. We want paybacks. We want revenge. We want to take it out on the people that have hurt us. They're going to get theirs, and they're going to get it on, by me. Revenge is a dish that's best served cold. Um, and that's kind of Hitchcock. I mean, he, you know, he, he'd build to the crescendo, and he'd build all this anticipation and all of this dread throughout the movie until it reached the crescendo. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. We're really going to talk about the Bible today. This wasn't about Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and 19. Here's what Paul has to say. 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You know, we want to get revenge. We want our paybacks. When somebody has hurt us, we want to get them and but good. And then there's the worrisome idea that... Um, there may be somebody who wants to get paybacks against us. And this is Paul's conviction that this evil is a merry-go-round. And around and around it goes. And there's no way to stop it if we continue to appeal to the atrocities that have been done to us, which in our own minds justify the atrocities that we perpetrate on others. And that it infects the community in which we live, whether it's a family or whether it's a church or whether it's a, a region like the Middle East. And if somebody doesn't break the cycle, if somebody doesn't break the chain, on and on and on it goes ad infinitum. My spiritual director calls this third way thinking. We have no idea, they were contemporaries, but we have no idea whether Paul or whether, yeah, whether Paul attended Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But what we have in our text this morning, chapter 12, verses um, 9 through 21, is kind of a summary of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. And so he's reminding us of the teachings of Jesus, and he's showing us a different way. And it's a way that is uh, counterintuitive. It doesn't seem to make any sense to us. Because it seems to say that we're saying that evil isn't real. No, evil is real. And when you have been affected by evil, it hurts. And it seems to be saying that evil doesn't matter. No, evil indeed does matter. But that there needs to come a time and a place where we bring it to its close, we bring it to its end. And so we do something that's counterintuitive, counter-cultural. We want paybacks. We've been hurt, and that son of a gun is going to get it, and they're going to get it but good. And that's the way that we think. That's worldly thinking. I'm doing a new book with my friends from high school. Um, we finished Chasing Francis, and now we're doing The Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, in the book, Christian is on his way to the celestial city. But on his way to the celestial city, he meets worldly wise man. And worldly wise man says, oh, you don't need to do that cross and all that personal suffering and sacrifice. Oh, that's terrible stuff. No, go to the town of morality and meet Mr. Legality and his son, Mr. Civility, and that you can escape all of the trials and tribulations of discipleship by going to the town of morality. After the second service, one of our members came to me and said, you know what I took from the passage this morning? Be good. Be nice. Be kind. I can't mock that enough. Um, and she says, no, but that's what it says. And you know what? 
She's right. Dang it. <laughs> However, we need to understand that going to the town of morality and listening to Mr. Legality is not what saves us. It's not what brings us favor in the eyes of God. That, that does not save us. Good deeds don't save us. Morality and being good and nice and kind doesn't save us. However, if we're saved and if we're a disciple and if we follow Jesus, then Paul is giving us a whole list of commands. Dang it that can be summarized in being good and nice and kind. Um, that's, that's what he's given us here. Now, this passage this morning has defied all of my attempts to outline it. Um, it, it just, it's impossible to outline this. Um, so let me give you another way to understand the text. This is a, an ancient form of rhetoric. Paul loved rhetoric. Um, and so he's going to use what was called perinesis. All of us have a um, laundry basket, right? And so you throw your laundry in there. There's your uh, unmentionables, they go in there. And there's your shirt, and there's your pants, and there's your sock. And uh, there's no order to that. The socks and the unmentionables all get mixed up together, but it's all laundry. So it's all of a kind. And so that's what Paul is doing in our text. This is called perinesis. And in perinesis, there's three hallmarks, three uh, kind of uh, pieces to the style of, of rhetoric that Paul is unleashing on the church in Rome. And so the first part is this. It's almost all, always, almost exclusively used for moral exhortation. It's just rat a tat a tat a tat a tat He takes a machine gun and he shoots you with command after command after command after command. Um, today we have a PowerPoint, and so these would be bullet points. We call them bullet points for a reason. And so each one of these is a bullet point on Paul's PowerPoint presentation. Um, they're not all the same thing, but they all fit within the laundry basket. They're all of a kind. Um, so if you look, and we've talked about this before too, biblical authors love bookmarks, uh, not bookmarks, bookends. And so look how the passage is bookended. Chapter 12, verse 9, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The idea is that everything between these bookends is about how we live transformed lives, how we're different than the world, how we meet evil with good. Nobody meets evil with good. This morning is a communion Sunday. Look at the table. Jesus met evil with good. Jesus laid down his life for us. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. These are the bookends. And the ancient commentator, Origen, Origen said this. Look at the text, particularly verse 9, but the text of that we're looking at this morning. And he says, you need to understand this. If you think that you can withhold love from your neighbor because they're evil, Jesus died once for all, the just for the unjust. If you think that you can withhold love from the one who has hurt you because they were a sinner, understand this, that Jesus died for sinners. This is a true saying worthy of all men to be received, right? The apostles Paul, apostle Paul and Timothy, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so Paul's admonition, Paul's lecture or lesson for us is to do it the way that Jesus did it, not the way that the world does it. And sometimes it feels, let's be honest, it feels less satisfying. We love to see when our enemies get their comeuppance, but Paul is telling us that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And who's better suited to ultimately bring justice and righteousness out of evil? than God himself, the one who himself is just and good and merciful, but he's also the judge, and he's also the one to whom each one of us will give an account of ourselves. So, Paranesis, it's moral exhortation. 
It's also built on a tradition. So for the Jews, he's quoting the Talmud, he's quoting the Mishnah, he's quoting the Torah, the law. And he may paraphrase it, but all of these things ring bells. They evoke memories that are positively associated with the things that Paul is saying so that it gives respect and it gives power and it gives influence to the text as Paul gives us this list of commands. And then the third, um, characteristic of paranesis is it's, it's loosely organized, it's impossible to outline, it's like a hamper. They're all of a piece, they're all of a similar, uh, uh, um, a similar theme, but they're not all exactly the same. So that's what Paul is laying out. Now what Paul is not saying is that evil isn't real. Evil is real. That he's not saying that evil doesn't matter or that when you're affected by it, that it doesn't hurt. Of course it hurts. It's real. And he's not saying that at the end of the day it doesn't matter. God winks at it and then he moves on. No, that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying, and this is the hard part, is that if we want to break the cycle, if we want to stop the merry-go-round, then we've got to come at this in a completely different way, in a way that we don't understand. Christianity is different than world religions. Um, you hear people tell you there are many roads to the top of the mountain. All religions are essentially the same. They all have the same ethical framework. There's a little bit of truth to that last statement. But Buddhists, for example, believe that um, evil is just another kind of goodness. Evil is illusory. It's not a real thing. And so the sooner that you get to nirvana, enlightenment, the better that you understand that all that stuff that happens that's bad in the world isn't real. Um, then, then now you're enlightened and you can live like, no, that's a bunch of junk. I love Van Morrison. He, he wrote an album called Enlightenment. You need to buy it and listen to it. In it he asks, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Don't ask me, I don't know. All, all of this spiritual stuff sounds good and sounds impressive, but it's, but it's not. No, evil is real. Again, look at the table set before you this morning. God so loved the world that he sent his son to take our place, that he is the one who has paid for the evil in the world. He's not diminishing it. He's not minimizing it. It's a real thing. But it's not ours to fix. We leave it in the hands of God. I've got a, a list of questions this morning. I, I'd like you, you, in your bulletin, there's a place for you to take notes. I'd like you to just maybe jot a couple of these down. But application from our text this morning, I'll come back to what Paul says, but application from our text. How should those receiving the mercy of God, us, how should we respond to all of these commands that Jesus is laying out for us? Because this requires a response. Um, we don't just listen, James says, look in the mirror and then we walk away and forget about it as soon as we turn our back. No, we need to think about these things. We need to hear Paul's commands and we need somehow to come to grips with them. Second, to what friend or enemy do I need to demonstrate more love? There are people that just get on our nerves. And so how might we express that love? Um, where do Christians in North America have the greatest need? Learning to love those inside the church or those outside the church? And I guess that depends on where you go to church. Um, but, but where is our focus and what should be our attention? You know, Paul raises this, or I'm raising this question because the background of what Paul is writing about is, is uh, important so that we understand how to apply these questions. So I told you a couple weeks ago, Claudius kicked the Jews and a lot of the Christians out because the, the Romans understood that Christianity was a sect of Judaism. And they, they were getting on everybody's nerves, arguing among themselves and raising a ruckus. So Claudius said, okay, enough is enough, out of here. And for about a generation, almost a generation, they were gone. They were kicked out of Rome. And Paul's writing in the early 50s now, and Nero is the emperor, and he rescinds the edict, and he allows Christians and he allows the Jews to come back to Rome. Now, and I said this a few weeks ago also, you remember when the bamboo curtain came down in China, and all all the missionaries, all the Western missionaries had to leave. And oh my gosh, the, the church in China is going to die because there's no white people there. Um, and then later, the bamboo curtain came up 
And we were shocked to discover that China is numerically the largest church in the world. The church did fine, thank you, without the white man's help. Um, but this was what's going on here in Rome. So the curtain came down, the Jews were kicked out, the curtain came up, they're allowed to come back now, but they're coming back to a Gentile church. And the Jews don't like the songs they're singing. They don't like that they refer to Jesus as the Christ, Latin, rather than the Messiah, Hebrew. And so they got on each other's nerves. They couldn't get along under the same roof. I'm not making this up. See, because this is in the back of Paul's mind. If you look at chapters 14 and 15, he's talking about don't judge one another, how to not cause your brother or sister to stumble, how to get along inside the church. So this is in Paul's mind as he gives us these commands. Then there's the issue of Rome itself. Rome was an oppressive government. And it persecuted Christians and Jews alike. Nero was infinitely worse than Claudius. They got on Claudius' nerves and he kicked him out of town. But when Nero came in, when he had a garden party, he would gather up the Christians and he would crucify them in his garden and he'd cover them with pine pitch and he would light them on fire. And his lighting system was Christians writhing in agony on their death crosses. Um, this is a persecution that we don't get and we don't understand. But if you look at chapter 13, the next chapter in the Bible, Paul talks about how we are to interface with an oppressive government. He doesn't say anything about be a culture warrior. He doesn't say anything about we've got to take our country back. Um, he says, no, that Rome is God's minister and that you are to submit to the governing authorities. And so these things, again, counterintuitive, don't make sense to us. They're gross. They're terrible people. Why should we submit to them? Because God has put them there. That's why. And so we submit to the governing authorities. So what is our response to those who persecute us? It could be the governing authorities, fortunately for us, at least so far, it's not typically the government. Um, here's another question. What are some subtle forms of revenge seeking that Christians practice against those who have harmed them? I moved here from Pennsylvania Dutch country. They are masters at this. They're not aggressive. They're not confrontational. They're passive aggressive. Um, there was a reporter that traveled with the Beatles, and I cannot remember to, the, to, to save my life what he said about George Harrison, but here's what he said about John Lennon. John Lennon will look you right in the eye, and he will eviscerate you. He'll cut your guts out while he looks you in the face. Paul, he'll put his arm around you, and he'll smile at you while he stabs you in the back. And Ringo? Ringo's Ringo. What you see is what you get. Um, so there are those who... Um, who have a subtle form, like Paul McCartney, of, of sticking to you, of stabbing you in the back. And, and what is the appropriate response when, when people inside the church, when people in the community treat you that way? And then here's the last one. How does the church's practice of love influence how the world thinks about God? They know what we hate. They know what we don't like. They're very clear on all those things. But do they understand the love of God in Christ? And how do we communicate that to them? Well, here's how we communicate it. And a lot of the stuff we may not like to hear. But listen to Paul one last time this morning as he gives this laundry basket full of mixed commands, but they're all under the theme of meeting evil with good. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and, call and, cur and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own eyes, in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace or peaceably with one another. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Verse 20, be hospitable and do good to the one that harasses you and does evil to you. And Paul here is quoting Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21. By doing this, you heap burning coals on their head. This is how the cycle of evil comes to an end. Paul is calling on us to heap burning coals. What's that mean? It means that we do good to the one who hurts us. Remember Romans chapter 2. Paul says that it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's not his wrath. It's not hellfire and damnation from the pulpit. It's not scaring people into heaven. It's the kindness of God. And that as Christ followers, he's calling on us to treat the world and all of the things they do and all of the things that they say that we don't like and to treat them with kindness, that by doing so we might heap on them burning coals, and that it is God's kindness that might lead them to repentance. The table this morning that we're about to come to is an expression of the kindness, the love of God. It's an expression of third way thinking. God could have just turned his back on the world and it would evaporate in a millisecond and that would have been the end of everything. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's what we celebrate this morning. Amen.